accomplished urologist, past president of the Urological Society of India, and the, currently he's the president of the SARC Association of, of Urology. So it's, it's a great privilege to have you. Welcome uh, and uh, namaste, Madhusab. So I'm really grateful for your, uh, your presence. Uh, second talk uh, will be by Professor Manzuru Sen, who is a very senior surgeon with a great interest in stricture disease. So both of these talks are basically uh, planned so that they can help you in understanding the diagnostic as well as decision-making in the urethral stricture disease. After this, we're going to have a, a case-based discussion on andrology, uh, again with the panel and the cases are designed so that they can help you in understanding the two major andrological issues, i.e. infertility and uh, erectile dysfunction. And subsequently, the last session uh, tonight will be on BPH. And we are very fortunate that we have uh, Tariq Sami, Ananda Dhanasekran from, and uh, Fahad Khan from uh, Birmingham in, in UK. Uh, Ananda is actually uh, a teacher of FRCS students. So he basically prepare people for FRCS exam. So he's an ideal person. He's going to take the last session of the day in which he's going to uh, uh, bring cases and help you in understanding how to make a decision in, 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 in situation with patient with a BPH. So without further ado, uh, it's my great pleasure and honor to invite uh, a dear friend from our neighboring India, Dr. Madhu uh, Agrawal. He is going to talk about uh, the various diagnostic means in the evaluation of urethral stricture disease. Dr. Agrawal, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Well, friends, thank you very much for this opportunity. It is indeed a great pleasure for me to be with you this evening. Um, Dr. Hamed is a great friend and uh, due to uh, the current pandemic, we have not been able to uh, meet physically, but we are always close to each other. And uh, it, it is, I was quite impressed with this uh, program of this entire week. And I must congratulate you for uh, having such a vibrant and uh, uh, such a uh, fantastic uh, academic uh, sessions which are going on uh, during these uh, difficult days. And at the same time, I also wish that uh, uh, you also, your country recovers quickly from this uh, second wave of COVID, which has been devastating in our country. And I hope it hasn't uh, uh, troubled you as much. Uh, coming uh, to the topic that we are going to discuss today. Uh, let me, uh, are you able to see my screen? Yes, sir, we do. Uh, Just click on that full screen yeah. mode. Okay. Uh, so you have the full screen now? Yes, perfect, sir. OK, so uh, uh, the subject that I'm going to talk about today is imaging in the evaluation of uh, urethral stricture. And uh, before I start, of course, I take this opportunity to greet you from the city of the Taj Mahal and uh, take this opportunity to welcome you to come visit India and Agra and the Taj Mahal someday. Uh, I'm your perpetual host in Agra. If you ever find an opportunity to come, just give me a call or send me a mail and, and you're welcome to visit and see this fantastic monument, one of the wonders of the world. Now, among the imaging techniques uh, for urethral structures, which are commonly used, we all know that the most common is urethrography, either retrograde or voiding or a combination. But increasingly, we are using the newer technologies like MRI, CT, and even ultrasound, which we shall be discussing in the next few minutes. Now, I think some of the things that I'm going to speak about are relatively elementary, and most of you would probably be aware of them already. So uh, please excuse me for being uh, rather uh, primitive in this, but 
I need to complete the list. So we know uh, the basic anatomy of the urethra. And when you do a retrograde urethrogram, you expect to be able to see all of it, the penile urethra, the vulvar, and the posterior urethra. However, it is important to remember that when you do a retrograde urethrogram, the focus is on anterior urethra. And the posterior urethra, which is the membranous and the prostatic urethra, are not so well evaluated in a retrograde urethrogram, largely because of the sphincter, which prevents good flow of and distension of the posterior urethra. So for simplifications purpose and for practical purposes, we are talking of the penile and bulbar urethra when we are talking of a retrograde urethrogram. And of course, you will be able to see a, a stricture, uh, short or long, annular or tubular, anterior or posterior, or a panurethral stricture. And most of the time, in a retrograde urethrogram, you get adequate information as to what the actual picture is. Retrograde urethrogram is also useful in other urethral disorders like diverticulum, in presence of a fistula, urethral neoplasms, which are relatively rare, and of course, urethral trauma, where it is very useful for initial evaluation. Although you may not always perform a urethrogram because in all serious urethral injuries, as you all know, uh, a simple suprapubic cystostomy may be the best thing to do in the initial phase. Now, I do not know whether this is still a practice, but in our residency days, it was always a urology first year resident who had to accompany a patient to the radiology suite for a urethrogram to make sure that the strict asepsis was maintained. Uh, a retrograde urethrogram must be done with full sterile aseptic precautions like catheterization because it involves catheterization. And uh, we used to uh, run around to the radiology department for this purpose uh, using a feeding tube and the radiographer would hand you over the contrast. Um, now we have the relatively safer contrasts with less risk of contrast uh, reaction. Uh, the oblique position, the classical position used for urethrogram. And you have to be careful not only about asepsis, but also about putting the contrast. I'll come to that in a moment. Uh, avoid uh, doing uh, a urethrogram in presence of acute or active infection or inflammation, uh, like in acute urethritis or periurethral abscess. So if you are not careful and if you, the contrast is injected with force, it can result in injury to the mucosa and extravasation of the contrast, which is actually called intravasation here because it goes into the blood vessels. And I'm sure many of you have seen pictures like this where the contrast goes into the uh, spongiosum or into or even to the vessels and gives you a venogram rather than a urethrogram. So retrograde urethrography can uh, lead to uh, problems like pain, hematuria, fever, and can even land the patient into urosepsis. And it is a good idea to cover these patients with an antibiotic, uh, preferably with a pre-procedure uh, uh, urine culture report if you have it, uh, because it is an invasive procedure, and if there is infection, you may actually introduce it into the circulation. So if you've done a good urethrogram, it gives you a good picture and shows you what the pathology is. Uh, on the right-hand side, you see an interesting picture. We often put it in our spot exams, um, and you ask the resident what the diagnosis is. Uh, anyway, so this is a patient with a bladder neck contracture, 
and a retrograde urethrogram has given us an inadvertent seminal vesiculogram and even a vasogram on both sides. Uh, quite a striking picture, as you can see. Uh, another investigation, uh, a, a, a branch out of a retrograde urethrogram, I would say, is a pericatheter urethrography. Uh, again, I am not sure whether we do it so much nowadays as we were doing it in past. Uh, often uh, recommended in follow-up or post-operative patients of complex urethral reconstructions, especially in the substitution types uh, before removing the catheter. So uh, we were doing it more often in past. Um, after three to four weeks of surgery, before removing the catheter, you inject contrast by the side of the catheter to make sure that the urethra is okay and there is no leak before removing the catheter. Um, it's, it's a good uh, investigation, uh, but I have an impression that it's not used as much as, as it was used in the past. So as I said earlier, for evaluation of the posterior urethra, retrograde urethrogram is not the best investigation. A voiding sister urethrogram is because it allows the posterior urethra to distend and then you can see the bladder neck, the prostatic as well as the membranous urethra. And you can also see the uh, proximal limit of the stricture if it is present. This is, of course, a normal urethra. It, this is actually a patient, a, a post-operative patient, a post-urethroplasty uh, uh, picture. So you can see normal caliber and the normal stream. You can also evaluate the bladder well uh, uh, in uh, avoiding cystic urethrography. So you put contrast into the bladder and ask the patient to avoid. The contrast can be put either through a urethral catheter or a feeding tube or through the suprapubic catheter, if it is there, which is often a case in a patient with a stricture of urethra, or at least an obliterative stricture of urethra. So uh, some of the uh, examples where a voiding sister urethrography will show you the distended posterior urethra also indicates the presence of the stricture and the extent, at least the proximal extent of stricture. So you combine this information with the information provided by the retrograde urethrogram, and you can map out the exact extent and the degree of the stricture very well. Uh, and of course, you can do one better by combining these procedures synchronously and do a combined study. And this has now become the preferred imaging study uh, most of the time. So a uh, combined retrograde and anti-grade widening sister urethrography with retrograde urethrography, especially if you have a suprapubic tube in place, can be a very good way of evaluating the exact length of the stricture, the exact defect, and deciding about the surgery. So you've got some of these examples in front of you showing the upper and lower limit of the stricture, the exact extent, and then you can take up the patient for surgery. So most often this study uh, is relevant in patients with pelvic fracture, posterior urethral injuries, and you can measure the defect and the gap and take a decision about the kind of surgery that you are performing, the perineal approach or the inferior pubectomy approach or the transpubic approach. Now there is one lacuna in this uh, uh, study, combined study, that many times the bladder neck fails to open. And this happens because of the apprehension or because of the pain which the patient may be feeling. And uh, for this, sometimes giving alpha blockers helps. Or you can use a uh, bougie from suprapubic and then do a bougiogram to see the posterior urethra and see the exact length of the defect. Otherwise, you can miscalculate the defect. 
So this is about the common study, the urethrograms, retrograde, integrate, and combined. Now coming to the newer investigations, MRI. Now MRI has found increasing role in uh, urethral strictures, a limited but useful role, especially in complex posterior uh, urethral, especially pelvic fracture strictures, patients with complicated uh, situations like rectourethral fistulae, and when there is a bone chip causing problem. And this allows you to understand the anatomy and the defect and take a decision about the kind of surgery that you are going to perform. Now, you have to provide contrast, which is water in case of MRI. So fill the bladder with urine and use jelly for the urethra. I'll ask the patient to strain so that the posterior urethra is also filled up. In an MRI machine, it can be actually difficult and you need a high uh, uh, value uh, MRI machine, at least a three Tesla machine so that it can be done quickly. Otherwise, uh, procedure becomes difficult. And if you draw a line from the inferior border of the pubic symphysis, it gives you an idea about the uh, high, how high the defect is and whether you can approach it from below or you require an inferior pubectomy or transpubic approach. Now, our friend, uh, Dr. Sanjay Kulkarni, who specializes in uh, urethroplasties and reconstructive urology, uh, has uh, published this very uh, interesting recent publication uh, on MRI uh, protocols in uh, urethral injuries and rectal urethral fistulae. Uh, and he has evaluated and explained how uh, MRI helps in complex injuries in deciding about the surgical procedure. It's a good uh, paper to go through. And uh, you can uh, add a lot of information to the conventional uh, urethrography uh, by doing MRI in selected cases. Uh, similarly, uh, CT scan can be useful, especially for the bone component in complex cases and patients who have bladder neck incontinence when you are planning some bladder repair. And uh, you can see that CT reconstructions the 3D reconstructions can be useful in these situations. Uh, a recent uh, use of uh, CT has been in uh, 3D printing uh, and creating models preoperatively for, uh, again, decision making before you take the patient up for surgery. And this is another publication from Dr. Sanjay Kulkarni, uh, which has evaluated using uh, the 3D printing technique uh, in uh, preoperative decision making in uh, difficult complex uh, posterior urethral strictures. And finally, a little bit of the role of ultrasound in urethral strictures. Now, the lumen can be identified by urethrogram, but the wall of urethra and the extent of spongiofibrosis can never be evaluated by any of these studies. Ultrasound comes in here because it can very nicely evaluate uh, this uh, component, that is the periurethral fibrosis and the spongiofibrosis. And you can see here how it correlates with the urethrogram. So um, in uh, uh, patients where you want to take a decision about the um, endoscopic versus open uh, or the extent of the resection of urethra if you are doing a, um, an astromotic procedure, then uh, sonourethrography can be very useful and correlate it with the urethrogram and it gives you a fairly good idea of what is in store when you go ahead for surgery in these patients. And in long obliterative strictures, if you want to see whether there is presence of intervening urethra or not, then it can be, uh, the, 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 when you want to see the lumen, then uh, sonourethrography can be of great help. And the latest uh, trick of the sonologist's sleeve is the 3D reconstruction from ultrasound. 
computer based where they can give you a 3d view of uh, the, the urethra from outside and from inside using the ultrasound guided 3d reconstruction how much useful uh, uh, this will be uh, only i think future will be able to tell so we can fall back upon the conventional uh, uh, radiology that is urethrogram most of the time and use these newer technologies selectively when uh, required uh, to evaluate uh, structure before we decide about the surgery and then we go ahead. Uh, so I, I take this opportunity to thank my friends who have contributed to my knowledge of structure urethra and uh, this presentation. And I thank uh, the, the Pakistan urology and the Karachi uh, chapter and Dr. Hamed for this opportunity uh, to be with you today uh, for this presentation. Thank you. And I'm Thank you, uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Professor Agrawal. It was a wonderful talk you have in a very short while, I think. Uh, and I think the important thing is the perspective uh, with which you explained uh, these basic uh, investigations and the, and the current uh, new armamentarium that are there. Um, there are questions in the chat box, and I uh, and the majority of our candidates uh, or delegates are actually uh, students who are appearing in the final fellowship exam in the next uh, ten days. So, right. uh, so these questions. Uh, uh, the first one is about determining the length of stricture. So, uh, this is something which uh, often. Uh, the magnification factor should be incorporated or not, and uh, should which view of the urethrogram should be. So, your your opinion about this? Yeah, um, as as I mentioned, the um, combination of a retrograde and voiding study uh, ideally gives you the correct length of the stricture. The um, magnification factor will not make too much of a difference because uh, I think it, it's one of the radiologist friends of mine told me that it's about 10 percent but uh, I'm not too sure not 100 percent sure on that. Uh, a sonorethrography uh, which uh, the, uh, the sonologist tells me is the most accurate uh, uh, way of measuring both the length of the stricture as well as there was a question about density, so the, about the extent of spongiofibrosis. Yeah. But I think spongiofibrosis becomes important, especially if you are planning an anastomotic urethroplasty. Uh, because if you are doing an anastomotic urethroplasty, you have to excise that area in, involving the spongiofibrosis as well. So there's another question about, uh, and, and this is something that I've seen even radiologists making mistakes and uh, some of the uh, uh, not well experienced people is mixing up the uh, sphincter with the stricture. So um, for the sake of precedent, uh, how do you how do you determine what is the sphincter and what is the stricture? Uh, this is one of the questions posted. Yeah, so the uh, in a retrograde urethrogram, the prostatic, the, the membranous urethra, the sphincteric area will never get, never show as distended. And uh, like you said correctly, uh, the radiologists very often report this as stricture. Uh, I, I have been at pains to explain to our radiologists, uh, but somehow it uh, is difficult. So I fully agree with you that in a retrograde study, uh, commenting on the posterior urethra per se is actually a mistake. Um, when you do a voiding study, then the internal sphincter sometimes fails to open up, as I showed in some of the films. And then you get a wrong impression of the length of the uh, posterior urethral stricture. And in those cases, you either give the alpha blocker, ask the patient to relax and strain and allow the the posterior urethra to fill, or you can do a bougiogram that pass a bougie from the suprapubic root and engage it into the posterior urethra and then take a picture. So for a, a voiding study, 
that all is probably the best way and for a retrograde study i think you can simply ignore the prostate and the membranous uh, you've gotten mute yeah sorry uh, there's another question about uh, uroflometry and how frequently do you use uroflometry and how reliable uroflometry is uh, in the evaluation of stricture recurrence or primary structures oh, uroflometry is a basic test which is required in all patients who are wide uh, i was talking i was supposed to talk only on imaging studies so i did not mention Euro, uh, uroflometry but uh, anybody who is passing urine uroflometry is a basic test so it has to be done in all patients uh, for documenting good flow even if the patient is saying he's okay and documenting poor flow if he is complaining of a poor flow okay can you shed some light on the role of contrast uh, okay so uh, contrast enhance ultrasound uh, you've yeah. talked about ultrasound yes yes and i, I think, I, think I missed out on that uh, contrast use use Uh, uh, jelly or use water with bubbles. You use shake, uh, add some air and shake the syringe, and then uh, you inject. There are actually prepared uh, uh, um, uh, contrasts available now, which have very fine yeah. bubbles in, in them, and you can inject that, and you do a contrast enhanced ultrasound. True. Yes. Great. Uh, I think. Uh... these are all the questions that have uh, about time as well yes so perfect <laughs> timing uh, i again thank you dr agarwal for this uh, wonderful talk and uh, i mean the 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 way you have gelled with the uh, with the crowd was was amazing so thank you very much for being here it has been a pleasure again once again and and i really enjoyed being with you all and uh, my best wishes to all the postgraduate students for their exam and i'm really looking forward to the physical meetings which are now going to open up and i'm looking to see you and professor mumtaz and professor manzoor uh, in in one of the upcoming meetings soon Indeed. if not uh, too far thank you thank, thank you, you very so much. much thank, thank you, you very much thanks a lot um it's my pleasure now to introduce professor manzoor hussain who has a very very dedicated uh, uh its stricture practice and i think he's one of uh, very few uh, real experts on urethral stricture uh, so he's going to talk about uh, how you are going to decide which type of reconstruction is done uh, under what circumstances so professor manzoor the floor is yours thank you sir thank you dr hamad um for uh, your kind invitation and uh, it was pleasure to listen to dr agarwal from india so uh we will this uh, we will just uh, in coming 30 minutes we will uh, discuss how to decide the type of procedure in urethral structure because it's important for urologists to decide because as we know we have got many options nowadays and it's it's also important to decide accurately what procedure is suitable for uh, this particular patient so as we know that uh, urethral structure management has changed and the old uh, the uh, step ladder fashion uh, of reconstructive urology uh, has changed uh, and the, in the older days we were just, uh, listening to the our seniors that uh, first you do the simple procedure and then you uh, do the uh, complex procedure so now it has changed now we can uh, as we have discussed the in the previous talk about the investigation by doing investigation we can stage the disease and then we can decide which technique is suitable for uh, uh, this patient so the management uh, depends on the etiology because if etiology is different then the management can be different and the results can be different and location of structure and extent of fibrosis and especially in our part of the world the multiple surgical interventions before they are referred here is also a factor which will uh, be important in decision making and we see that uh, the treatment options varies from the endoscopic measures endoscopic uh, uh, methods like dilatation dviu lasers stents and then the gold stener to urethroplasty 
Uh, as we know, the dilatation, Dr. Hamad must be knowing it, uh, this remembering it when he was house officer here in SIUT. The, this is the first lesson we learn in our house job, the how to do a, a gentle dilatation, which is less traumatic. One of the oldest operation. And nowadays, the, uh, the indications for youth dilatation, blind dilatation should not be done, but the indications for epithelial uh, dilatation is the, the stage one, according to divine classification or epithelial structure or superficial structures without spongiofibrosis. So this is the indication for youth dilatation nowadays. And uh, we must be remembered that uh, the goal of uh, dilatation is to stretch the scar, not to tear it. So if there is a bleeding after um, dilatation, that means we have made the uh, stricture more worse and we are tear it. So it should be gentle and uh, the, uh, the goal should be to stretch. And the, the latest treatment, uh, less, latest di dilatation uh, uh, method is the balloon dilatation. As we know that gluten and lister bougies were being used and now we are shifted to the simple, uh, soft catheters or the guide wire. And the latest method, our least uh, traumatic method is the, is the urethral balloon dilatation under fluoroscopic guidance on the, over the uh, guide wire. A DVIU is another um, uh, met endoscopic method which uh, can be done in non-traumatic or non stedal injuries strictures, um, 1.5 centimeter or less. And the principle is to in is the incision of the scar tissue so that the, the lumen of the uh, stricture heals in large. And um, as we know that the, the commonest site uh, of uh, incision is at 12 o'clock, but uh, 2 and uh, 10 o'clock is also a, a site. But if you go, as we know that the darts, uh, this uh, posterior, this valvular urethra uh, has got thinnest part at the 2 and 10 o'clock position. So if you go deeper, then you can bleed, uh, cause bleeding, and ED is caused. But the recent... Uh, a uh, report showed that uh, the DVIU has got um, uh, success rate around 20, but the previous reports were 74% for 1.5 centimeter stricture uh, with not stedal injuries, but other causes like um, post catheter or uh, hypospadias or iatrogenic and idiopathic. So urethral stents uh, were in fashion in 90s, but nowadays it's not the, but most important uh, urethral uh, stents were urodome and um, uh, the other uh, removable uh, stents. But the unique complication was that the pain during the coitus and pain during the uh, cycling and difficulty to remove it and incrustation. So nowadays the stents are not being used and we don't see anything in the new uh, recent literature on the stents. Uh, Lasers, uh, various types of laser has been decently used and we are also using it as SIUT. And the carbon dioxide laser, argon laser, KTP and holmium lasers are in fashion. The ideal laser is which vaporizes the tissue and has got negligible peripheral tissue destruction. And although in our case, the results of laser urethrotomy are better than the DVIU in terms of recurrence of structure are less as with the DVIU uh, laser, but the international literature uh, shows that it's a mixed, the results are mixed and equal results have been reported with the DVIU and lasers. Uh, so this is the laser which, uh, Holmium laser which we are using. And uh, uh, just to show you how it is different from the DVI, you, you can see the precision of the uh, incision and circumferential incision of the stricture. And VN is clear as compared to the DVIU as you all have witnessed or you have observed. So in this case, as you can see, I'm giving incision at the 12 o'clock position and there's a no bleeding, almost no bleeding. So the patients with uh, um, and anticoagulants are the better candidates for this laser DVIU. And uh, in my experience, are in, at, in, at our institute, the 
the results of in the terms of a recurrent surface texture are better with the laser as compared to the uh, DBI. So, it takes more time and we use normal saline for irrigation and um, uh, this was a large structure and patient is catheter free uh, uh, since last two years. As you can see the precision and clearness of the field while you are doing the laser euthrotomy. And, uh, so that then after the endoscopic management, the urethroplasty is the gold standard and the results are better with the urethroplasty as compared to the endoscopic procedure. So as a urologist, we must think of uh, beyond the urophilometry in the case in the management of uh, urethroplasty, uh, in the management of urethra structures. And uh, the aims are not only to restore the voiding or flow to improve the flow rates, but to preserve the erectile functions to store the fertility and to improve the cosmesis. And after all, the patient reported outcomes are also important for the, uh, the uh, to assess the success of urethroplasty. So urethroplasty uh, structure management, we divide into the penile, bulbar, pan urethral and posterior urethral structures or PFUI. And uh, options for penile urethral structures um, in our center are in the international literature, which is current, the free graft BMG urethroplasty is currently the, uh, the um, substitute of the, of the operation of choice for the uh, penile urethral structure uh, reconstruction. And then if the BMG is not available or BMG cannot be done, then the penile skin flaps is an art is an alternate. And the free skin graft and second two stage urethroplasty is the last one for the patient who are who have got infected cavities and uh, uh, the skin is uh, not healthy. Uh, so this is the uh, operation of choice for the penile urethral uh, structure, the dorsal inlay penile uh, urethroplasty. As you can see, uh, we are given the ventral incision and uh, uh, ventrally opened urethra and dorsal incision is given and then the buccal mucosa graft is placed in the dorsally and uh, it's spread cool and culted and then uh, re, re, uh, the urethra is tubularized. So the dorsal inlay BMG urethroplasty in our experience gives the best results in um, the management of penile urethra structures. As you can see in this patient, uh, there is a penile urethral structure at the mid portion and, uh, and uh, there was a complete obliteration. So in this case, we have augmented, we have done the, the dorsal inlay augmented by ventral only BMG urethroplasty. So two graphs were used in this case. As you can see this two graph. So penile skin flaps uh, is an alternative to the repair of uh, uh, penile urethral structures when BMG is not available or not suitable like in our, in our country. We know that many people are um, addicted to beetles. So we can uh, do the Orendi procedure and also the dorsal uh, penile skin flap for the repair of urethral. Uh, Lachin sclerosis, in this case, patient was not willing for BMG, so there were two uh, strictures, one at the meatus and other at the uh, bulbar urethra, and we have done the meatotomy, extended meatotomy, and the bulbar urethra sticker was uh, incised by the laser. And uh, for the distal urethra, uh, distal urethra strictures like um, um, for some navicular is the Jordan's operation. If patient is not having this um, BXO or latching sclerosis, is gives the best results. And this is the vertical DASI operation. And, uh, and the classical teaching is that for the BXO, we do the two stage, one stage excision of the structure, and then the graft is placed. And after six months, we tubularize the graft. So for the bulbar structures, the uh, and the options are the excision and primary reanosmosis for one to two centimeter structures and augmented anosmotic repair for two to four centimeter structures and substitution for four, more than four centimeter. And we have got four um, 
options for the uh, substitution urethroplasty, dorsal only, ventral only, lateral only, and dorsal only, depending on the experience of surgeon and choice of the surgeon. But if it's a steadal injury, then the graft should not be used. And for the steadal injury, one, two centimeter, the choice is the EPA or excision and primary reanosmosis. As you can see, it gives the more than 90% success rate uh, in our experience, more than 90, 93%. But reported uh, success rate is more than 93, even 95, 97%. Uh, this is a non steadal injury uh, structure in the bulbar part. And uh, in the non steadal injury bulbar part, we prefer to have a, a graft rather than uh, the EPA or excision primary anosmosis. So in the EPA, you know that the, the concern was the, about the uh, erectile dysfunction. And uh, in EPA, 18 to 22% can have a uh, uh, stricture. So there was a search for a better treatment like um, an, a vessel sparing, uh, trans, uh, vessel sparing um, primary anosmosis as uh, uh, professor, uh, suggested by Professor Jordan. And um, uh, this is the uh, is recurrence of bulbar structure after DVIU. This was an idiopathic uh, structure. As you can see, there were two history of two in this DVIUs and then again recurrence. So in this case, we did the non-transecting urethroplasty uh, as well by Professor Mundy and, uh, and Rich. And uh, as you can see, the as you can uh, as you know that bulbosponges muscle it it acts as in the help in ejaculation and it helps in um, uh, post wide improving our uh, this prevention of post wide dribbling. So if you save the muscle, bulbosponges muscle and now by just re uh, retracting it and then doing the dorsal only BMG, then we can prevent these two complications. And we have done in some patients, the indications are the same as, uh, um, but it should be shorter and uh, more uh, distal uh, bulbar structure for this type of uh, muscle and nerve sparing uh, bulb, uh, bulbar urethroplasty. And dorsal only uh, urethroplasty, as advised by Professor um, Bar Bagley, gives the best results, uh, but it should not be used for the uh, this uh, steadal injuries. It's for the non steadal injuries. And uh, indication is about four centimeter to five centimeter stitches can be treated, and results are ninety five percent at middle mid term follow up. And uh, this is the ventral uh, ventral only BMG urethroplasty for the pino bulbar urethral stitches six centimeter. As you can see, the indications for uh, uh, ventral only BMG is. Are the almost same depends on the experience and choice of the surgeon, but if we can uh, close the uh, carpus spongiosum over the uh, BMG, then it's this gives the good results. Um, and as you can see, we have uh, uh, have uh, mobilized the uh, sleeve of carpus spongiosum, uh, and then. Uh, after placing the BMG, we have uh, given or uh, reinforced the our urethroplasty site by the sleeve of corpus spongiosum, which we have uh, saved before. And this patient is uh, catheter-free and symptom-free for last one year. Augmented anosmotic urethroplasty is indicated when the in the cases when there's a complete obliteration and stitches uh, length is more than two centimeters. So what we do is that we excise the uh, fibrosis or completely obliterated segment, and then ventral ends of both ure urethral edges are anosmosed with each other. And then it is augmented on dorsal side by the buccal mucosal graft. Uh, the augmented anosmosis with, can be used with the uh, circular penile skin flaps, and they were in the patient, but this is the second choice, uh, and the first choice is the BMG urethroplasty. So the buccal mucosal graft can be taken from the lower lip, especially for the distal urethral repairs in children, and little dorsal little aspect of tongue and the inner side of the cheek. And uh, as you can see, extensions that must be saved, and uh, you can take six centimeter of uh, uh, this uh, BMG urethroplasty. 
the penal skin flaps um, are useful for the strictures which are due to radiation therapy and failed buccal mucosal graft or buccal mucosal graft is not available, then indication is, is still there. Uh, like this is the uh, ventral, transverse ventral only. And then panurethral strictures constitute seven to 8% in our uh, uh, all stricture patients. The options are dorsolateral BMG urethroplasty suggested by our friend, uh, Mr. Kulkarni, Sanjay Kulkarni. And we can use two BMG grafts if there is a intervening normal urethra and there's a sticker in the penile part and a sticker in the bulbar part, then we can use two grafts. And then combined tissue transfer techniques can be used for example, the, for the, if the BMG is not available, we can use the penile skin flap in the fashion of Oran-B flap for the penile urethral sticker and dorsal only BMG for the uh, bulbar urethral sticker. Ventral only BMG is also a, uh, uh, this option and Q-tip penile skin flap popularized by McNeish uh, is also a, uh, can be done as a salvage procedure. And if the patient is old age, cannot afford this uh, multiple operation, then perineal thrustomy is another option. And many patients, elder patient, elderly patients are happy with the perineal thrustomy. They don't ask us for the reversal. So this is another alternative for the old age patients. This is the ventral on the BMG patient is catheter free for three, three years. And uh, this is the dorsolateral uh, BMG urethroplasty. And uh, these are the two graphs, one for the penile, one for the dorsal. And uh, this is the combined circular Q-tip flap for the pan sticker. Abdominal wall skin graft is also another uh, available uh, option if the other uh, materials are not available. And this two-stage Johansson's is indicated for those patients who have infected cavities and cannot be uh, repaired, or the urine culture is positive constantly, or uh, there's any indication for multiple urethra fistula called water can perineum, then there's an indication for first is a Johnson urethroplasty, open the urethra perineal thrustomy, and then we give incision in the, as after six months, we give incision in the, Urethra as a dorsal inlay and BMG urethroplasty is uh, done as a second to second stage. So pelvic fracture urethral injuries, as you can see in this case, there are pelvic fracture of both the, um, uh, uh, there's a diastasis and a, a fractured pelvis. And you can see the anterograde and retrograde combined um, urethrogram, which gives you exact length of a sticker, the exact length uh, actually is shorter than what we see in the urethrogram, but it can be higher. Like in this case, diastasis of pubic rema is a, is a, is a, is a factor, a risk factor for um, uh, abdominal perineal approach and for the uh, ED in the post uh, urethroplasty period. And the, the PFU, the, the PFU uh, progress approach is uh, uh, the options are the progressive perineal approach, uh, like uh, suggested by Webster, and then combined abdominal perineal approach, uh, or procedure, and then transpubic or waterhouse approach. So it depends upon the uh, anti preoperative assessment and the. So we start with the perineal approach first, and uh, uh, as you know that. Uh, with perineal approach, uh, the uh, lambda incision and mobilization of the bulbar urethra, um, because if bulbar urethra is uh, S-shaped, and if you mobilize it fully, it gives you two centimeter extra length, and division of crura gives one centimeter extra length, and pub a partial pubectomy gives you one centimeter, and rerouting gives you one centimeter. So five to six centimeter sticker can be uh, the loss of urethra can be approached with this uh, um, progressive perineal approach. But if it is not uh, possible, then we combine the uh, uh, this uh, progressive perineal approach with the abdominal approach, and we do the pubic tummy from above, and then we anosmose the urethra to the anterior surface of the prostatic urethra and we give the omental wrap over the uh, this uh, uh, repair. Uh, so this is the 
the dorsal artery of uh, penis, which can be ligated. If you ligate it, then bleeding is less, and we should uh, uh, limit our uh, dissection in the midline to prevent the damage to the corporal nerves and vessels. And then there is the anosmosis is done. And pubic tummy, we use chisel and hammer, but uh, some people use uh, the scissors and diathermy and also the bone nibbler. So this is the, uh, we give about eight to 10, um, four zero PDS sutures for uh, the um, anosmosis and lone star retractor is good and turnover retractor is also uh, helpful and uh, equally good. So this is the anosmosis seated. So results of surgery, curative rates, uh, if it is done properly and assessed properly preoperatively, then the yeah, the repair of PFUI gives you more than 90% success rate. And failures are not due to technical problems, but technical problems, but uh, anosmotic restenosis can be because, in most of the cases, can be because of uh, proximal corpus spongiosum ischemia. If the anterior urethra is abnormal, then there are more chances that there will be ischemia. But if the, uh, the fibrous tissue is not excised properly or not excised fully, then it can be a cause of uh, recurrence. And if the anosmosis is under tension, then it's also likely to have a uh, recurrence of the structure. Uh, so the complications which we have faced is bleeding, stress incontinence, recurrence of structure, and ED and CORDI. CORDI is extremely rare. Bleeding means necessitating blood uh, uh, transfusion is about uh, four or five percent. We must arrange the blood. Stress incontinence can occur in um, four to five percent, and recurrence is taken around ten percent, ten to fifteen percent in long term. ED can result most of the time from the uh, trauma itself, but uh, the ED is possible to be caused by the extensive uh, pubic, after extensive pubectomy and uh, damage to the carpal nerves. And this uh, ED after um, this EPA urethroplasty and bulboprostic anosmosis is underreported, underreported, I, I personally. But at least four or five percent cases, uh, they say that we were not having ED before uh, and we have become uh, uh, develop ED after. So this ED, fortunately or uh, luckily, is it responsive to all intercorporeal injections in, in, in uh, uh, all the patients. But very few respond to phosphodiesterase inhibitors. So ED is treatable and uh, uh, recurrence can be treated by laser and uh, DVIU or redo operations and stress incontinence by Kegel exercises and uh, deloxetine uh, deloxetine uh, is, is equally good. I think one or, except out of 500, out, only one or two patients are uh, not well with the, these measures. Otherwise, continence is the, is the rule if the blood and neck mechanism is okay. Um, but it can occur if there's a blood and neck damage or um, if there's extensive um, uh, surgery, it can be a cause. So patient should be counseled uh, for these things. And infertility is also a problem, but in many cases, the infertility improves after in the good anosmotic urethroplasty. So this just to show you, this is a case which is a redo, redo case and uh, membranoprostatic junction obstruction. And you can see the the dilated blood and neck and posterior urethra. And this was the operated case somewhere else. We did uh, pubic tummy, extensive pubic tummy and uh, bulboprostatic anosmosis. And this patient become, uh, had developed stress incontinence. As you can see, the blood and neck was open and he was on suprapubic for five years. So bladder is also small. So patient is improving on Kegel exercises and deloxetine. So these are the patient who can be risk high risk for the uh, incontinence whose blood and neck is open on the anti-grade or warding cysto -uthrogram. Thank you very much, Haman Sab. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Manzoor. It is uh, very comprehensively covered uh, uh, various aspects uh, of a very complex disease. Um, I see a few questions here and I'd like you to take them. Um, 
So, what is your standard uh, time for indwelling catheter after an optical urethrotomy? It's a, it's a, I think it's a three, three to five days, but uh, mostly we use it for three days. But as you know, that uh, data shows that there's a no any advantage of keeping the catheter for longer time. And we use silicone 16 effort. So three to five days is the indwelling time for after laser and also DVI. There's another question about uh, uh, the preferred graft or flap for radiation uh, associated strictures. So what, radiation? what is your preference? Yes, we, we, you, we prefer the penile skin flaps and um, uh, vertical are depends upon the where the uh, the skin is in abundance. Okay, yep. uh, so if it is on the ventral aspect, we take the vertical uh, penile skin flap. If it's on the dorsal, then the transverse dorsal penile flap on the dartus fascia. We bring it down into the bulbar urethra. So there's another uh, resident who would just to know with the difference between dorsal inlay and dorsal only, although you have talked about it, shown yeah. the picture as well, but... Uh, yeah, so dorsal, dorsal inlay is that patient is in lithotomy position and we have opened the sticker on the ventral aspect, okay? And then we give incision in the urethral plate on the dorsal aspect and we place the graft to the carpora. So this is the dorsal inlay. And dorsal only, we don't uh, open from the ventral aspect. We mobilize the uh, uh, bulbar urethra and we separate it from the, uh, the triangular ligament or the tunica albugina, tunica, tunica albugina uh, the triangular ligament. And then we rotate the urethra uh, ventrally. I give incision on the dorsal aspect and then May, according to measurement of the um, length, we take the graft and when we then we spread and fix to the carpora and then we suture the graft to the estricturotomy and the dorsal aspect. So this is how we... Right, uh, there's uh, one more question about uh, the difference between augmentation and substitution urethroplasty. Okay, so substitution urethroplasty, uh, it can be substituted by the, you know, the, by the uh, tubes, uh, the grafts. And uh, as we know that the, if it is more than four centimeter, then it is substituted. And in the substitution, it can be substituted by the, uh, this tube by from the flap or the, from the graft. But as you know, that tubes are not good than the graft. So we don't use the tubes and uh, substitution is just augmented, can be substituted and uh, after excision and graft is can be substituted or simple. This augmentation can be ventral or dorsal only BMG. Great, I think uh, you have covered uh, most areas and uh, these are the questions that you have addressed. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Manzoor, for uh, this very comprehensive talk. And I'm sure that you must have cleared a lot of complex concepts of precedents about stricture disease. And they would answer your questions correctly when, uh, when you examine them. Thank you very much. I'm extremely thankful for your kind listening and for your invitation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Manzoor. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, so after this uh, two wonderful talks on ureth urethral stricture disease, uh, um, we move on to the next session. And the next session is going to be moderated by Dr. Bajahat Aziz, who is a dedicated andrologist in, um, at Aachan. And he is very ably supported by two gentlemen who have uh, a very dedicated practice over the last many, many years in the field of andrology. Uh, Dr. Khaliku Rahman from Fatma Hospital in Lahore, uh, 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 andrologist, uh, and Dr. Uh, Nasir Suleiman, who is uh, really a master of all games. And andrology is something that uh, he really is one of his passions. So Dr. Wajahad is going to uh, discuss cases and the panel is there to uh, discuss uh, 
the options. Feel free to uh, address your questions to Dr. Bajad and those will be addressed by him and the two panelists. So over from me all to Dr. Bajad to take up the floor. You can't hear you, Dr. Ajayat. Sorry, uh, I, I am audible now. Yes, you are now. Okay. Okay. So the first thing which I have noticed with few years of clinical experience at, is that you can group them into few clinical syndromes, the patients with erectile dysfunction. On one end of the spectrum is that patient who is, who is having the mainly a metabolic syndrome and other who is more towards stress-related factors. But in general, usually it's a spectrum. It's not that you will have one patient who definitely have a metabolic syndrome and the other one who definitely have a psychological component, but uh, usually there is an overlap and there is an, a spectrum. And the third type of portion increasingly in the internet age is the young guy who is basically concerned with uh, erectile dysfunction, learning about few things on the, over the internet. Uh, so the first case uh, is a 45 year old banker married for 10 years and for last two years he has noticed gradually worsening erectile dysfunction his desire is fine uh, past medical history is essentially unremarkable uh, he has used some herbal medications uh, but uh, he doesn't have and have any improvement uh, He's a smoker, 10 per day. Uh, my first question would be, how would you quantify his problem? This young, relatively young gentleman, 45 years of age, is gradually progressing uh, erectile dysfunction. What are the ways of quantifying his problem? You can uh, write your answers in the chat box. Uh, Uh, so yes, mostly we use one of the uh, scoring systems as for lower unit type symptoms. Most commonly used is IIEF, although there are other scores. Uh, and this IIEF has been translated into Urdu by Dr. Khalifa Rahman here uh, and his team. What I have noticed going through this, uh, basically learning from this questionnaire, uh, the two most important specs which can quantify uh, the symptomatology are how many times you are unable to achieve erection or a satisfactory intercourse, and how many times you have a difficulty in achieving erection. Uh, so this is quite useful and I'm trying to incorporate in my clinical practice just like we do for uh, lowering attack symptoms and SPSS. Okay, on examination, uh, he is overweight, large suprapubic fat pad, otherwise the genitalia are unremarkable. And the Jorgen guidelines, this is from a few years back, but it was very really nicely put, then this statement has been removed subsequently, that all patients who present with erectile dysfunction should have at least these baseline tests, namely a lipid profile, a fasting blood sugar, and a testosterone levels. Uh, uh, increasingly, I have gone found of HPA1C rather than doing a simple uh, FBS, which usually they have. HPA1C is more representative of overall metabolic syndrome. Uh, uh, Dr. Khalik and Dr. Nasik, would you like to add something to the initial investigation or in your practice you do something in addition? Uh, I would like to 
do serum prolactin as well, although it is not that common, but uh, one can miss uh, any cases of hyperprolactinemia uh, in such situations, in, in few cases. Okay. And some people also additionally do a uric acid level because it has also been shown to be associated with erectile dysfunction. Uh, but this is the minimal that one should do. A fasting glucose level. Someone has suggested serum albumin. Well, uh, these additional tests like Dr. Nasir has suggested a prolactin level, a serum albumin, a uric acid level. Well, you can do it at the baseline, but there should be some reason or some suspicion to have the additional testing. Otherwise, at the very least, one should get an FPS, a lipid profile, and at the least serum testosterone levels. Okay. Uh, well, uh, there, there's something interesting for these days, uh, like we are in post COVID times, so any, any chronic illness, I, I found that after this dengue, there were many patients who had dengue and post dengue, they devel developed these symptoms. Also this hep C, there are areas where hep C is uh, prevalent. So I usually like to go for an ELT uh, in, in selected group of patients. Yes, this is, these are not the guidelines. Uh, testosterone, well, I would say after 40, now people are uh, getting into testing testosterone as well. Uh, I would be keen for any, any possible tests because only if we find a cause, only then we can help these patients. So any patient who had a chronic uh, illness or a fever of any kind, uh, like a urine examination would always tell me whether, uh, I mean, about the kidneys of the patient. So that's how I usually deal with it. Yeah. So very important point that always look at the complete picture and try to pick up a, a, a chronic disease other than the radially known like diabetes or hyperlipidemia. Try to pick up uh, the chronic disease and urine DR is a good screening test for that matter. Uh, 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 sort of an MCQ question. Yeah, what are the most common examination and the most common laboratory arrangement? Uh, so the evidence suggests that the most common examination finding is not surprisingly, not unsurprisingly, is raised BMI. Or if you are measuring the waste the, uh, the waist, uh, raised waist to hip ratio, that is the most common examination finding, that namely the obesity. And the most common laboratory judgment is usually a hypertriglyceridemia. And yes, of course, you can add uh, other things depending upon patient's condition. Okay. Uh, so the whole point in doing these investigations is to basically identify, as Dr. Khalid mentioned, and manage those underlying, and I have intentionally removed. These are not so, as such causes, but the risk factors. And the problem is usually not uh, arising from a single cause, but rather multifactorial. So in this somewhat overweight guy uh, with, who is a banker, a smoker, and you got some basic workup, usually these type of risk factors you can identify. Uh, so what I usually do, list the risk factors and give the list to the patient as well. Okay, my next question would be, what is the first line treatment depend, is usually dependent upon the cause. So all of you agree with it. Uh, those of you who agree, okay. Uh, I would say that this statement is partly true. Uh, it is true in terms of like, you would always address the underlying cause as previously discussed, but ultimately, at least for the symptomatic management, the first line treatment, whether it is psychogenic, 
whether it is arising for metabolic syndrome is usually PD-5 inhibitors. Uh, sir, uh, your thoughts on it? Uh, Dr. Khalid, Dr. Nasser? I would, I would argue that first line treatment is PD-5 inhibitors in terms of symptomatology. Hello. We can hear you. Okay. So, well, uh, this biopsychosocial model is one of the best, I would say, because some people, they have uh, a social problem, like something happened with their partner. She said something and then it developed, went into an innovation. So I would say that we need to probably... Uh, from the beginning, focus ourselves onto the biopsychosocial model. And on the second visit, because both biopsycho and social, they could be initiating event, they could be precipitating event, and they could be continuing event, propagating event. So if we make a cause today, for example, diabetes is initiating event. So we would see that that would be the cause initiate and then precipitating event. But then we have to follow diabetes with HbA1c, whether it is coming down or not. Similarly, if there is a social problem from day one, like this guy is separated from his wife, and now he says he has ED, he separate, separated from his wife. And it's not that simple of giving him PD-5 inhibitors. Yes, they would ensure him. But then this has to be a holistic approach. So on the second event, uh, sorry, on the second visit, we have to see what is happening uh, in the light of uh, the cause that we determine on day one or maybe after investigations. So th this is how I look at it. Yeah. So this is an important insight that uh, it can be other, uh, uh, this, these are interacting factors that something initiated the erectile dysfunction. And uh, say, for example, the patient is now secondarily depressed or secondarily feel so-called low desire because he does have erectile dysfunction. Or it can be the other way around, that it's, it started off with some uh, psychosocial problem and now then he becomes secondarily have erectile dysfunction, so very rightly said. And yes, and then uh, things are like uh, I would say for younger people, sometimes when they get married, things are quite complicated. Some yeah. of them they have, for example, orientation problem, like they they are interested in uh, males rather than females. I mean, so this is why this uh, biopsychosocial model. It has to be uh, from the beginning. We have to mark it and then follow it. Exactly. Dr. Khalid, I would also be presenting the next case of a similar nature. So back to this guy who has this uh, so-called metabolic syndrome, explore uh, his social issues as well as biological problems, address them. And of course, he would be a candidate of some sort of PD-5 inhibitors, at least for reassurance or get him back to his resume his sexual activity. Uh, okay, and from the exam perspective, I I am reasonably sure that uh, most of you people are uh, 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 aware of small differences between the PD five inhibitors. Uh, uh, okay, somebody have said that PD five inhibitors is difficult to identify. I will talk about it further. Okay, uh, let's talk about our second guy who presented uh, with exactly what Dr. Dr. Khalik was talking about a young guy, 28 year, year old, married for two months and is unable to have intercourse. He has attempted a few times. Uh, desire is okay. He does feel attracted to his wife. Past medical history is unremarkable. He hasn't used any medications. Somebody told him that to use some of the multivitamins, but uh, those haven't caused much effect. He has his, his routine of his worker, doesn't have any addictions. Uh, examination for, uh, findings are essentially unremarkable, except that they pick up a mild left varicose. Uh, quick question. 
uh, how would you address, given this history, uh, how would, would you be concerned about the varicose seal of this patient? You can write your comments in the chat box. Dr. Nasir, your thoughts on it. Young man presents with non-consummation of marriage. And incidentally, you pick up that he has got this mild varicose seal. Yeah. So very rightly mentioned, but I have put it intentionally because I have seen patients uh, in which somebody picks up the varicose seal and he, they, they go through all the treatment for the varicose seal. And the main problem with, mind you, may be psychological, but again, we need to follow the same model. I, I wouldn't be too much worried about the varicose seal. Anyhow, it is a mild varicose seal. And uh, this is a question about uh, either consummation of marriage or having erectile dysfunction. So a mild varicose seal, as far as ED is concerned, really doesn't matter. So this can be ignored uh, as far as I'm concerned. And exactly. we need to focus on other factors. Uh, any further questions in history? This is uh, something, as Dr. Khalid was mentioning, is quite difficult to explore. You need to explore his orientation, that's one. Uh, and to find the specific cause, what is exactly happening. Uh, so what I try to do, uh, I try to uh, rebuild the bedroom. Uh, so I asked them what exactly happened. If you attempt to have intercourse, uh, are you able to achieve satisfactory erection or not? Uh, how are the erections? Yes, nocturnal erections as well as early morning erections. Uh, is there any difference between the spontaneous erections versus those which you are able to achieve with wife or during masturbation? And uh, also some of the female factors, it really helps if uh, he can come back or he comes with wife. He, she can actually corroborate because sometimes the patient is saying that I do get erection and but unable to have intromission, but then the wife would tell that erection is not really of good quality. And then you have to explore uh, things, uh, practical things like use of lubricant. Uh, and again, uh, the according to guidelines, this statement of getting a fasting lipid profile uh, in RBS and a hormonal level in all patients is reasonably okay because of course, most of the time, these come as normal in these patients, but yes, this should be done. And this is one guy for which I would probably prescribe him PD-5 inhibitors in his first visit. Uh, your thoughts on it, sir? Uh, yes, sir. Well, I have, I have, sorry. Personally, yes, I would uh, start the patient on the PDE 5 uh, one can discuss whether one can need to give a low dose uh, daily uh, treatment or on demand basis. Uh, I would like to know Dr. Khalid's practice. Uh, yes, yes, very right. This is, this is the way. Uh, but there is something, another interesting thing to it. Uh, when I looked at the literature a couple of years ago, I found there were many studies from... Uh, Iran, from Middle Eastern countries, and from uh, Israel. Uh, these are the places uh, we can share some cultural thing of uh, shyness together. And it was interesting to find out that female factor, female sexual dysfunction was found to be the cause in some of the studies in over 60% of the cases. Now, in my experience, it is not over 60%, but still I expect that it could be 20 to 30%. Because what happens is that initially when there is no response or the response is of a kind where female would avoid the male and in the process, in all that, uh, uh, trying to have an intercourse with all that anxiety that people have because they had no exposure in the past. So kind of they develop, uh, they lose their erections and then there is a vicious cycle. So now I go for female sexual 
function index to either directly or I give them the questionnaire to find out how the female is doing. Uh, because sometimes even the gynecologist, it, it becomes difficult to diagnose these people. But my, I have couples where female factor was, was basically the problem. And then after that, due to that factor, secondarily, the male also developed erectile dysfunction. Yes, very rightly said. I have witnessed one patient who presented with priapism and was still unable to consummate the marriage. So, yeah, very true. Uh, so, for these patients, uh, usually, uh, of, uh, on, I would not be reluctant to prescribe them PD5 inhibitors. Some was somebody mentioned that get a penile Doppler. But well, most of the time, like starting off giving a trial of PD5 inhibitors, especially if there is a short history, if there is a, a long history of non consummation, it was there like for four or five years or a couple of years, in all likelihood, they have already tried it. But still, uh, I would like to give them a trial of PD5 inhibitors, explore the female factors, use of lubricant, uh, uh, tell them. Uh, educate them about the coital technique and ask him to bring his wife at uh, on next subsequent visit. Uh, okay, regarding, I think I, one thing I wanted to address, don't be afraid of prescribing PD-5 inhibitors to the people who really need them. So this is one guy, if he has not already used it, it's there is no harm in prescribing it. Otherwise, these things, these Hakims and all, we leave the ground for them. Okay. And somebody mentioned that there is a problem with PD-5 inhibitors. Definitely, yes, it is a problem. It, these are not legally available in Pakistan, but that should not be uh, inhibit you whenever clinically indicated to mention it in an exam scenario or prescribing it to your patient. Okay. As Dr. Khaliq was mentioning, this uh, is from Egypt. And they called it so-called honeymoon impotence and use alternate adalafil for it. And 90% of the time, if there is a short history, they were able to achieve vaginal intromission. Uh, you follow up this guy in two weeks, he has used some PD-5 inhibitors and noticed some slight improvement in erections, uh, but is still unable to consummate. The lab results are normal. You got a normal testosterone levels a normal fasting blood sugar and lipid profile. Uh, the possible causes. Uh, uh, so this is exactly what Dr. Khaliq was mentioning about that we need to address the psychosocial factors, the female factors, and rarely with the problem is in the hypogonadism. To be uh, honest, uh, they, they usually I get some borderline low testosterone levels and I just cross check them with a morning sample and I have rarely if ever found this is to be the problem, especially in this scenario. Uh, uh, as you can see in this patient, uh, uh, 34 of the patients, the problem was with vaginismus, which is one way of saying that there was some female factor. Uh, interestingly, interestingly, I have seen one patient in which the orientation problem was with the female partner. She categorically told us that she feel disgusted with the act of sex per se. Okay. So, uh, uh, so they have tried some PD5 inhibitors and some use, use some lubrication. The wife verified and they have come back. Uh, so I would label it as so-called failure of medical therapy and could consider some next step in management. Uh, all of you agree that this quantify as failure of medical therapy. Or would you want uh, some other manipulation before proceeding with something? Okay, no. Uh, Okay, if you go by the book, this does not constitute as so-called failure of medical therapy. One would argue that you should consider switching from one PD-5 inhibitor to other. You should consider escalating the dose if not appropriately used. You should consider change of the brand. 
but I agree with you guys, uh, theoretically speaking, this would not constitute a failure of medical therapy, but practically speaking, for this patient, I would not insist further on medications. Uh, Dr. Nasser, your thought on it? What I normally do in such cases is we need to explain to the patients how to take the medications because uh, as far as uh, sildenafil is concerned, it needs to be taken on an empty stomach, whereas uh, tadalafil, you can have it with meals. But the important thing to explain to the patient and the partner is that after taking the medication, you need to have a foreplay at least for 10 to 15 minutes because this foreplay is quite important in uh, the release of the neurotransmitter nitric oxide. And I explained to the patient that these tablets will not cause the release of the neurotransmitter, but it prevents the destruction of the neurotransmitter. So one needs to spend some time with both uh, patient and the partner to explain this. So this is quite important. And uh, as mentioned earlier, we need to give a low dose PDE5. Uh, by low dose, I mean either a tadalafil at five milligrams or uh, sildenafil uh, 25 to 50 milligrams because uh, this uh, prolongs the action of the natural release of uh, nitric oxide. And then on the day of uh, sexual intercourse, one can take the full dose of either uh, sildenafil 100 milligrams or uh, tadalafil 20 milligrams. So that's how I manage these cases uh, to start with. So the point here is, the point here is that you address the underlying factors important. Lee, and you do give a consideration to practical issue because before declaring it a failure of medical therapy. As Dr. Khalid previously mentioned, it could be just a female factor which is uh, presenting as so-called failure of medical therapy. Okay. Uh, the next step is usually once you have addressed these concerns is an intracavernosal injection. And there are two ways of going about it. Either you do it in clinic or do it in ultrasound department. Uh, and the ideal situation I have noticed with Dr. Khaliq, what he does is that he has arranged for ultrasound within the clinic. Dr. Khaliq? Yes, sir. please. Sir. Yes, that, that is very interesting, yes. Yeah, so I have found it very important that if you yourself give the intracavernosal injection and you are yourself, it's not an, a difficult ultrasound to do, and you yourself are looking at the vascularity in terms of doctor studies, so that makes much more sense as compared to a radiologist written report. So that is probably the ideal situation. Um, uh, may I just add one thing that uh, it is intracavernous injection and stimulation test. So some of these patients, especially in our culture, it is really a big deal uh, to lower one's trousers. And for the first time, if you give an injection and maybe there are one or two other assistants around, uh, there is such a strong sympathetic stimulation that it may not work, injection may not work. And the second time, if we use it in a relaxed condition, then the injection may lead to priapism. So uh, what I do is after I, I try to give them an atmosphere which is not inhibitive, and then after giving this injection, I would tell them that I'm going out for five minutes. And in the meantime, stimulate yourself, think of something good. And then I go back and do the test. Uh, generally, my now what I do is when if I am giving intracavernous injection for the first time, I don't do the Doppler on that occasion. If there is no response, then on the second or third time, I would go for the Doppler test because it is well known that psychogenic factors, they can 
construct the vessels and also there is this psychogenic venous leak as well. So this is why when we get reports of Doppler from our radiolo radiologist colleagues, then most of these reports, they say venous leak. But we are able to manage them uh, when, when we give them, administer these injections under relaxed circumstance. So my point is intracavernous injection has to given with in relaxed conditions and with some self-stimulation by the patient. Now this is important. This is something which I have also incorporated into practice that always cross-check. You have given intracavernous injection in clinic and the response was plus minus. Cross-check either by getting an ultrasound and then uh, uh, or if you have got an ultrasound report, cross-check by giving once it at least once in clinic. So the findings should make be consistent and should make sense. I, uh, I have may I may I share an interesting example. It was a new thing for me. I had a patient. Uh, I booked him for uh, penile implant because he did respond after three injections. Well, he said because there is a venous leak and now because we are less keen for doing venous leak. But some of the patients who are, because it has like 50% of the results. So I went for a, a CT cavernosogram because I said if I would find a single or maybe two, three venous leak in the penile region, I would go for it. But interestingly, this was the fourth injection and this guy developed priapism. And later on, because you uh, probably, he was now more relaxed and later on this guy got married and he he even after one year he came back to me and he, and he didn't even require uh, pde5 inhibitors so my point is this is an exception yes i have just seen one such case but i have seen cases closer to this so the point is uh, we have to check and cross-check as uh, Dr. Vajahat is saying. Very right. Very right. Yeah. So, uh, so say similar to the example of PT5 inhibitors, that don't be jump to declaring a failure. You see, uh, use it a few times in different scenarios. Uh, uh, use, branding is also an issue. Usually we used to use Trimix, then availability become an issue. So this, this is quite convenient, especially if you are teaching patient to be at home. And also if I see a plus minus response, I do ask them to try it at least once at home. Uh, so although the preabism is really sometimes a concern, but you need to tell them about that possibility. So yes, don't jump to concluding a failure of intracavernosal injection or declaring it a venous leak. Uh, so this question has already been asked, by, uh, already been addressed by Dr. Khali. The way to confirm a uh, penile doctor is not a confirmatory test for venous leak. Uh, there are some prerequisites. You need to have a good inflow. A peak systolic velocity should be at least more than 50 centimeters of second to declare it as venous leak. Uh, the hormonal profile should be normal. The patient should be in a relaxed state. There say, are some prerequisites before just... Uh, by seeing the picture like this, you can't declare that this is a venous leak. So some, uh, some uh, other consideration should also be there. Okay. Uh, so the confirmation, especially if you are considering some interventional therapy, is usually with a cover nosography, like a CT cover nosography. Uh, but if you are reasonably sure, as is as does happen with some of these guys, especially with the prolonged history. Uh, that this is a venous leak or uh, not necessarily that the underlying problem should be the venous leak. If you have a failure of medical therapy and a failure of intercavernosal injection, he would become the candidate for next treatment options. Uh, this is one thing which Dr. Khalid was try, uh, talking about that if you can definitely see a couple of veins to consider a vein ligation surgery, but this has largely fallen out of practice mainly because 
in those patients who have multiple leak point, this does not usually uh, work. So you have to be very selective in selecting these patients. Uh, Dr. Khal uh, Dr. Khareeg, your thoughts on it? Yes. Hello. The option of venous ligation for surgery uh, for venous leak. I would say like this is this this rarely works. Are you rarely find an, an ideal candidate for it? Uh, yeah, yes, I agree yes, with I you. Agree. Actually, Actually uh, the one of the most uh, effective methods is to go under the box fascia, and it takes quite a long time if you go under the box fascia all around, lift the neurovascular bundle and then uh, tie and coagulate even all the emissary veins and everything. Uh, yes, it works in some people, but then what happens is that many of them, they, this recurs within a year. So 50% of them. So if, and th there is another thing, if there is a venous leak deeper down, into the where this corpus cavernosum bifurcates, then we go, go into the area where the blood supply and nerve supply of the penis is actually uh, there. So uh, we, we are then taking the risk of uh, damaging rather than doing some improvement. So I would say if there is a penile venous leak and the patient is well motivated, and we can mark it properly on CT cavernosogram. Yes, we can do it, provided the patient is okay with 50% success. And, and as it, compared to that, implant would, would give a 95% success. Uh, Another uh, uh, can I add something on the venous <laughs> leakage? Uh, during my training, abroad in Bristol, we used to do fairly routine dorsal vein ligation, uh, but we found in our result that after one year, there was only 2% success rate. So what one needs to understand is there is something wrong with the tunica albuginea and not the veins. Because if you can remember the normal physiology uh, with the expansion of the tunica uh, albuginea, this causes compression of the imagery veins and it is the trapping of the uh, venous return uh, which uh, gives a penis rigid for erection. So perhaps the problem is with the tunica albuginea and not with the veins because uh, the Americans, they have even tied off the veins inside the pelvis with not good results. So I will agree with Dr. Khalik that the final uh, treatment would be uh, penile processes in such cases. Yeah. Uh, and Dr. Nasir, while you are on it, another possible theoretical option is this. I personally haven't, this is vacuum erection device. This is how it is supposed to work. But I personally haven't seen anybody happy with it. Definitely not in this young guy with non-consummation of marriage. Very true. Okay. So ultimately, he is looking at this. So if there is a failure of medical therapy followed by a failure of intracavernosal therapy for whatever reasons, you try to address the reason. This is important before jumping on to the final conclusion that the medical therapy has failed, but the ultimate solution is this. And these are the two options you are all aware of. Uh, malleable implant versus three-piece implant. And this is how you place the three-piece implant. The reservoir is either in the pelvis or you can place it uh, deep to the muscles only if there is an intra-abdominal surgery like in post-prostatectomy patient. And the pump should be placed in a location where the patient can easily access it. Uh, okay. Uh, for the, so I would now switch to the patients, uh, to the other aspect of endology. Uh, may, I, may I please just add one thing because I think it's very important. Uh, please 
Hello? Sure, sure, sir. Sure. Okay. You see, these patients who come with unconsummated marriage, they are in a conflict situation. And sometimes they are at the verge of uh, uh, breaking their marriages. So we need to know that how, how they are doing is, uh, I mean, and how much time do we have? And we have to be quick if they have less time. I mean, sometimes we have these uh, problem with appointments and the next appointment, maybe uh, we say that come after three weeks and in those three weeks, they have such a conflict situation that they would uh, break up. So I think this is something very important because once they break up, then depression, reactive depression adds to the, uh, to the existing uh, problem of unconsummated marriage. Yeah. So very true. Depression actually comes in package with this situation. And this also answers the question. Someone has suggested that gave a five milligram daily dose of Tadalafil for three months. No, three months is too long a time to consider. I would give it at least for a couple of, at the most, at a 